Hi, welcome to CSI podcast number 17. Today is November 6th, 2015, getting towards the end of the year. Uh, my name is Mark Griffin, and I'm joined by Mr. Ozzie Reynolds, who everybody should know. He's infamous. But the really important guy today is Steve Ernst, who is the programmer between, behind all the Fargo stuff. So if you've got numbers you don't understand, he'll explain them to you. <laughs> <laughs> sure. Isn't that how it works? <laughs> That's right. I mean, you're the guy, right? That's right. Okay. He's glad somebody's the guy. <laughs> Anyhow, uh, we're just bringing back the podcast and bringing you up to speed because we got a lot of things going on. It's a fast-moving world and a lot of things. And Ozzy's going to take off and give you the rundown since he's the organized one. I thought I was just going to sit here and listen. You and can I do that. Do anything. It'd be the first time this week. All right. The first thing we want to do is talk about a few of our upcoming events. Um, this weekend, as a matter of fact, November 7th and 8th, we have the NYC 8-Ball Championships in Astoria, New York. That's Tony Robles. That is and Tony, company, meaning Tony wife Robles. And company. Yes. Tony yeah. and Gail Robles, yep. <laughs> right behind that, next weekend, November 13th through 15th in Orlando, Florida, is the 2015 Florida Regional Championships. You can still sign up for that until Monday. You can sign up online. After that, it's on site only. And a little bit down the road, December 2nd through 6th. And this is a brand new tournament. We just announced it today in Madison, Tennessee, which is just outside of Nashville, is the first ever Southeast Regional Championships. That'll be at JOB Billiards Club in Madison, Tennessee, again, just outside of Nashville. Uh, you can sign up for that online right now. So get to yep. it. Don't wait. That room's been there for like forever. You know, Jim Blaylock was the owner forever, too. I mean, he's been in like 30 years, a mainstay. And then in 2016, um, we've got the Wisconsin State Championships. Location and dates to be announced very, very soon. Uh, like how soon is soon? Well, I like thought maybe it was, Monday. I thought it was going to be, be today. today. See, uh, cat got your tongue. There's one more T to cross and I to dot before yeah. we release that information. Yeah. So I think it's going to be Monday when yep. we can release. That. I expect it to be Monday, and uh, it'll, uh, it's it's been a long process, and we like to get our events posted and calendared a lot faster but sometimes things are just out of our control they just things just don't happen according to Hoyle yeah. and then we're going to have the 20 we get a lot of calls and messages about this one the 2016 U.S. Bar Table Championships mm -hmm. location and dates to be announced we're getting close people relax it's coming um I, I will tip the cards and say that there is a high likelihood it will not be in Reno Nevada this year yeah, I'll say that much. I, I think that's a pretty uh, safe thing to say. Locations and Location and dates to be announced very soon. And for now, the reason we're here, Mr. Steve Ernst, partner and programmer in Fargo Rate, was in the office uh, the last couple of days, and we're taking the opportunity to make him do a podcast. <laughs> <laughs> nice. So with nice. that, uh, Steve, why don't you just give us a brief introduction for the people that have been living in a closet what is Fargo Ratings? Okay. So I will give a summary. Kind yeah. of even kind a little of history. Yeah. Yep. And and then a little history. Deeper information can always be found on our website, FargoRatings.com. Gets a little more into things. But essentially, what Fargo Ratings are is a performance based, ELO based rating system for pool players. So by ELO based, it's similar to kind of what chess does for rating players. It's similar, and the reason that it's similar to that is there's no absolute measure of winning in pool, right? It's not like high jumping where you have height, or swimming where you have time, or golf where you have par, bowling where you have 300. There isn't that same thing. Right. In pool, you win or you lose. Correct. Now, you could say in straight pool, you can have some measure, yeah. but... Um, but you win or you lose. So that's that's how we developed the Fargo ratings system is based purely on performance wins, losses. So it's strictly history based. It is strictly history based. There is no inning count or missed shots or anything like that. It's purely wins and losses. So the benefit of that is it makes the math very transparent. You win, your rating should go up. Under most circumstances, if you lose, your rating goes down. But it's, it's really based upon the probability that you should win that match. So if I play Shane Van Boning 
and I beat him, there's no way I should win that match. So my rating will go up by a higher amount than if I were to play Ozzy. And I shouldn't beat Ozzy either. That's but if a I, lot. <laughs> but if, you should beat but him if more I, than you beat But if I, if I do beat him, my rating will not go up by as much. Likewise, if I lose to Shane, as I should, I will go down, but not as much as I would go down if I were to lose to Ozzy, because I have a higher expectation in that match. Thanks again. Yeah. <laughs> and, and the scores, like if you get beat 10-9 or 10-2, <clears throat> makes a difference. It does. Okay. Yep. Because it's performance-based. Yeah. Yep. So the math behind it is, is, is rather complicated in, in how it all works out, but essentially you can think of it as a giant network of, you know, the two million games of pool that we have in the system right now that are between player one and player two and player three and four and five and player 30,000 and player 60,000. And every time a match is played between any of those players, we record that information, who wins and who loses. And it turns into just this giant mess of data. The cool thing about that giant mess of data is there is one number that you can put on every person that makes the probability of all of those matches working out the way they worked out to be as maximum as we can. The maximum probability that those matches turned out the way that they did. Now, that's a lot of heavy lifting when it comes, when it comes to the computation side of things. And you do all that by hand. We, we do. That's, that's, that's why you're so busy. <laughs> the, so we, we actually you know, have an, an automated system that takes care of all this. We bring in tens of thousands of games a day that come into the system, even more than that on, on most days. And then once a day, the math grinds through everything, optimizes the, the system to get, it, to get everybody their ratings, and then they can use I them. want you to repeat that. So every day, the whole system optimizes everybody. So everybody. everything is re recalibrated. Every 24 hours. Every All 24 30, hours. All 30,000, 40,000 players. Yep. Okay. And that's an important, that's, I wanted to make sure everybody it, understood that. because it, it is a big an important <laughs> thing. And here's the significance yeah. of that for, for people who aren't familiar with, with this type of system, is that your rating can change and you haven't played in two weeks. Correct. So people get, get very stymied by that. It's like, how is that possible? I haven't played. Well, the reason it's possible, and not only possible, but happens a lot, is other people are playing. The people that you played two weeks ago are out playing and more information is entering the system about them and the people that they've played. And this, this whole network of 30,000 players or 40,000 players is changing every hour. So you are, as a player, a part in that, that network. And as such, you're influenced by what goes on around you, whether you play or not. So that, that is a significant piece. Now, we're not talking that your rating will move 15 points when yeah. you didn't do anything, but a point up, a point down. Well, and that depends what your robustness is. It is, and that's, that's a very yeah. good point. So we, we talk a lot about the Fargo rating number, which is, you know, essentially between 200 to 800, you know, higher, lower sometimes. But there's another very significant number that comes with that, and that's the, what we call the robustness. And it's a complicated sounding word, but all it really means is how many, how much information does the Fargo rating system have about a player? How many games, that's exactly what it means, is how many games do we have for them? Right. The higher that number, the more accurate we can produce a rating. Mm -hmm. So if you were to use uh, our fair match application, for example, you will see that some people we have five games for, but we don't have a rating for. We do have a rating but, it's so, but it's so volatile that it's essentially meaningless yeah. once you get to about 35 games it starts getting better 100 is even better and 200 is kind of the, the benchmark gold standard. for yeah. being basically established yeah still subject to a little bit of variance but not wild swings yeah <clears throat> so when you get into two gentlemen like well use Shane as an example again he has 6,000 6, games or something like yeah, that, yeah that we have for him in the system so he doesn't move yeah. very much as much as if he had 60 games right. in the system. You still move, but. Which a lot of people say, so if he has a terrible performance, they'll say, well, how come his number didn't change? Well, it's not supposed to fall off the map. It's just <laughs> supposed to move itsy bitsy, you know, because it's, it's an average of his past performance. Yep. And then older data falls off it, somehow, right? It, it, gets... it does. So the, the way to think about it is, if I play a game today, if, if Mark and I were to go in the back and play a game of pool right now, that counts 
the results of that count 100% towards my rating adjustment, how much I go up or down. If we travel ahead in time three years and we play again, that one now counts one, and this one that's three years old counts 50% of what it counted. So another way of saying that is three-year-old matches count half of what today's matches count. So if you don't play for three years, your rating is essentially 50% of what it was if you absolutely do not play a match for three years. And eventually you would just fall off altogether if you stopped playing. That's correct. Okay. All right. Too technical for me. Um, but that's why <laughs> Steve is here. That. It's too technical. So, so Steve, I'm going to ask you just a couple questions uh, about Fargo ratings. How can Fargo ratings be used to place people in divisions, for example? A lot of our tournaments have multiple divisions. Historically, it might be men's open singles or men's advanced singles or women's open singles or women's advanced singles. Very subjective, largely based on how you did in the last tournament or the tournament before that. Sure. So how, how will Fargo ratings or how could Fargo ratings change that? So Fargo ratings have already been used in several different capacities. Um, one is to do just that, to essentially get rid of the arbitrary division boundaries of open or master or A's and, and double A's. Yeah. <laughs> and, and to create, still you have different divisions, if you will, but the people in the divisions are now ranked or placed into those divisions based upon their Fargo ratings. So you are playing players that are close to your number. Mm -hmm. And we'll, we will talk a little bit about, uh, kind of how the numbers compare to each other. But just a, a real quick thing is roughly a hundred point difference is kind of, it, it's hard to say twice as good, but that's essentially yeah. what it means is twice as good. Would win twice as much as the lower Yeah, and player. that's, it sounds better when, so if, if you and I were to play and I was a hundred points ahead of you and we play a race to nine, I'd beat you six to three, all things being equal. Yep. Race or, puts its or race, a race to, five, to nine or, and you'd beat him six to three. I mean, Come on, yeah, Mark. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it's good. <laughs> or a race to five, like a five to two, a five to two sort of thing. Right. I, I was race seeing to, if you're awake. How about race to eight, eight, eight to four? Yeah. There, there we go. <laughs> got it. Got it. But it, it does mean twice as many victories or 33 to 67%. Yep. So Which, so if you were to set up a, a division or in, <clears throat> in a tournament that had people that were all within 100 points of each other playing each other and another division, say 400 to 400 level Fargo rating to 500, and then a 500 to 600, you have much more equity in the spread of, those, of that talent than you do if you just have an open, and you can go from 400 level players to 700 level and players. And we found that, because we have no way of measuring people, a lot of unknowns. The data doesn't come from the league side, it only comes from tournament side, so you're, you're having a lot of play, but you don't get the information, so sure. it's very limited. Yep. So, so that's that's the this most is exciting stuff. That's the most popular way so far that that Fargo ratings have been used to divisions. They've also been used to place. If you have an open division, you use Fargo ratings to seed the division. So yeah. you you kind of have. It, we don't really like to use Fargo ratings specifically for rankings because there's a lot of other information that can go into that. But for seeding tournaments and things, it works very well. Yeah. Another thing that people need to understand is. Fargo is, is come because it's come the guy that came up with it, his partner, Mike Page, they're both from Fargo, North Dakota, but they own Fargo Billiards. And you've been Mike running, owns Fargo well, Billiards. Well, right, okay, yeah. that's what I mean. Yeah. But and yeah. he's been running this system. It's been tested and run through the mill for what, six years? Five yep. years, six years? Yep. So six it's years. field tested. It's not like we're coming, hey, let's do this idea and just throw it out there in the middle of the street and see what happens. Yep. This is uh, it it's been tested and run over every which way you can do it <laughs> yep. you know so it's but well, it's exciting last question steve uh explain to the people watching this podcast about the differences between men and women because right now for example uh let's take some state rating system and let's just say they use a b c d okay a male a is not the same as a female a in almost every circumstance a male eight in some state is not the same as a female eight. Likewise with us at a national level, an open rated man is not the same skill level as an open rated woman. So what about Fargo ratings? Is that still the case with Fargo ratings or 
is that different? It is absolutely not the case with Farga ratings. <clears throat> when I talk about this this large pool of players and all the matches, mm -hmm. that's there's not a men pool and a women's pool. It's all the same all pool. coupled together. Yeah. Yep. Yes. So when a woman plays a woman, that's part of the pool. When a woman plays a, a male player, that's part of the pool. When a child plays an, an you know, adult yeah. player, that's it's all in the same pool. So the benefit of that is if, say there's a, a, a woman player that we don't know a lot about. We've, we have, a, say, 50 games, but they're all amongst other women. That, you know, that tells us a lot because we do have ratings on, on the mm -hmm. other women players. When she plays a male player, and let's say he's a, a 500, we'll just say, and she beats him 10 to 5. What should her rating be? It doesn't matter that she's a female player. She's a player who just beat a 500 Fargo yeah. rated player 10 to 5. That's twice as good. She should be around a 600 level yeah. player. The more information we get like that among all the women and all the males, there's there's no more distinction of a, a female A or a male A. It, it becomes irrelevant. Strictly historical data. It takes away all the subjective <clears throat> You know, it, it's it's funny. People say, well, I don't think that guy's an eight. And somebody says, well, I think he is. Well, I haven't seen him shoot. Well, that's great. What happens if there's 20,000 people in your system? You're going to go out and watch all of them on a good day and a bad day? Exactly. It doesn't work. This works. So let's show an example of that. And this is just one reason why players should care about Fargo ratings. We're going to show you a graph of sort of the old way and the new way. So if you look at this, the old way... It's not uncommon for a player, let's call him Bob, to have three different ratings. His league rating, maybe they use an average system. They play eight, eight ball on a 10-point system, for example. His average might be 7.65. Maybe at the state level, there's a committee or a board that runs the whatever state championship. They use an A, B, C, D system. They have Bob rated as an A. Then he comes to the BCA Pool League National Championships, and we at the national office have him rated as an open player. So Bob is at the same time a 7.65 in league, an A in his state, and open at nationals. Confusing. The new way using Fargo ratings, Bob might be a 5.67 in league. He's also a 5.67 at the state level. And guess what? He's a 5.67 when he comes to nationals. Much more clear, less confusing, everyone on the same scale. Another reason this is important for players is divisions. And uh, Mark and Steve hinted at that uh, just a little bit earlier. Let's show that other graph when we talk about placing players in divisions. So I went back and looked at data from the 2015 BCA Pool League National Championships, and specifically the Men's Open, open Singles advanced. Division. Open, right. Not so advanced, open. The Open Division. Yeah. So we looked at the Fargo ratings of all the players that played in that division. There was 812 of them. This year, July 2015, the maximum rated player in that division was a 744. The minimum, and I'll be honest, I, I removed some of the extreme outliers due to low data, right? Because maybe all the data we had on them was like one match or two matches. But the minimum was 67. The spread there is 677 quote-unquote points. That is an enormous spread. And what that means is there's an enormous range of talent. 744 by our definition, using Fargo ratings, is a pro caliber player. Well, Corey Jewell's a 765, to put it in its perspective. Right. <laughs> so, <laughs> And a 67, yeah. you know, who knows, but probably not a very high-skilled player. The point is there's a huge spread there, and it's not very equitable. Using Fargo ratings, theoretically, if we did this in 2016, for example, we could tighten that up. We could get it, for example, just throwing numbers out there, so that the maximum Fargo rating is 619 and maybe the minimum is 520, making the spread 100. Lots of people, almost everybody in that division, now has a good chance of winning. You don't have those extreme spreads within divisions. 
you're playing somebody you bought approximately your own speed. That's way more equitable. Yep. Uh, another example is handicapping. We don't handicap in the national championships, but we do in some of our state and regional events. So let's show that one. So here's the old way. John is rated a master player. Bob is rated an open player. Under a lot of schemes, including some that we run in, in our different state and regional tournaments, that race would be seven to five. Uh, because typically a master player goes to seven, an advanced player goes to six, an open player goes to sure. five, and a leisure player goes to four. That's that, typically what you see. That could be a really good master or a really weak master. So there's those ranges. So it gets to be a big range. The new way, using Fargo ratings, and these numbers are completely made up, but assume that John is a 684 and Bob is a 550. If you go to the Fargo rate fair match application, if you plug those two ratings into that app, you see that a, indeed a fair race is 7 to 3, not 7 to 5. Typically under the old system, the better players can outrun it because it's not equitable. Uh, going to be more difficult using Fargo ratings. But what that is supposed to be, and you can correct me, but that 7 to 3, what it's really doing, the system is computing where both people have the best chance closest to 50-50 probability of winning with, that match. With just a, a, a small addition. As small as possible. Yep. That's why if you look back at that chart, it, could, it, was, it might be uh, uh, 7 to 3, it might be 8 to 4. And then it could be nine to five. It depends where the break is. Yep. As the match gets longer, you know, so there's yep. variables. So if, if you were to look at that chart again, um, as as Mark was yeah, saying, bring that up there's if you can, there's because there were a few couple. Of yep. There's lots of combinations. Yeah, three to on two. That. Three to two. Four to two. two. See, there's a huge difference. Three to two or four to two. Yep. Because so it's the numbers are so small that the 50-50 shot. You, that's how you have to get there. Yep. So what what this system is trying to do now? Now keep in mind, kind of what I what I talked about right away is based on the probability that a player will win. Mm -hmm. So what, what fair match attempts to do is to calculate as close to that 50-50 probability for both players without the advantage going to the lower player. Right. So that's that's the distinction. And the one that's highlighted on here, the 7-3, to three, is the one that is the closest to 50-50. To really? See, I, th I would thought it, would have thought it would have been the 13-6. to six. You would think because as you would get it's, more it's information long, yeah. to the longer race. It, it happens, though, in this particular case, that if it was... 14 to 6, it would have been the same ratio right. as 7 to 3. Right. And, yeah. and uh, one other benefit that players should really care about is the artificial rules that we've always had to put in place can now be tore down. Uh, one of those rules could be, for example, if you finish in the top whatever usually four percent of the men's open singles, then the next year you're automatically in, rank, rated as advanced and you have to play in the advanced division. Um, that is no longer the case. I mean, if your performance warrants your Fargo rating moving up and that happens to put you in a different division, fine. Uh, but it does happen sometimes that people win tournaments without winning all that convincingly. And you could theoretically win a tournament and your rating just not move up very much. Um, pretty unlikely you would win a tournament and not move up at all. Uh, but those barriers yeah. can be put away. And Mark calls it the kiss of death, right? Because a lot of players, when they win a tournament, they get bumped up to a new division. You never, never see seen. them yep. again because they know they can't be competitive yeah. in that next division. So why come all the way out to Las Vegas? All the amateur leagues have that problem. Every one of us, you graduate the people, and they just, everybody wants to think they have an edge. And this is really the more equitable, equitable method of you playing your peers. And that's really what it's supposed to be. You know? And at a state and regional level, uh, you see quite often committees and boards form, and they often form as a means to great players in that state or region. Unfortunately, what happens sometimes, not all the time certainly, but sometimes uh, committees and boards start to use that really as a weapon against the players, and that's no longer the case. Ratings can be completely objective based on performance and mathematics, there's not a group of people or a person deciding what your rating is and where you should play. Players should really care about that. Why should league operators and tournament directors care about Fargo ratings? Well, there's no longer a need for subjective ratings, which 
quite often will upset players, right? How many times I, I've run tournaments. Yep. Players, well, very rarely do they agree with the rating that you have decided <laughs> that they play at. And let me just pop in because <clears throat> there will be some apps available. So a person's in the system, they want to know where my rating came from. They can push a button and it'll show every match that they played. So it's as far as people say, well, it's not transparent. We want to know where the number comes from. Total transparency. You what? played Joe Blow and Sam Smith and Clyde Jones, and here's what you did. Well, let me clarify, yeah. that's coming. That's, yeah. that's not yeah, no, there it's not, it's not there, but it will be there by the time everything rolls out. We, we also will be introducing a brand-new league management software that Mr. Ernst has been working quite hard on, um, complete with scoring apps for both the BCA Pool League and USA Pool League. So the best way to take advantage of Fargo ratings and all of the new gadgets that's coming is to sanction your league with the BCA Pool League or start a USA Pool League in your area. Also, you know, we have our own tournament management system that we custom built for our tournaments, and really it was built for large tournaments like our nationals. We will be introducing down the road a, uh, I like to call it a scaled-down version for tournaments all over the country and really the world to use. Anything from a eight-player weekly tournament on Friday night to a state or regional championship to whatever. It will be available, and Fargo Ratings will be built in. By, by Fargo Ratings built in, it takes the information and pushes it towards Fargo. So yep. it makes it simple for the operator, <clears throat> and there will be apps that you can do everything with, uh, with phone apps and stuff. Yes. That's correct. And finally, um, you know, I feel like I'm doing most of the talking, which is probably terrible. Uh, why should the industry, Steven said, uh -huh. why should the industry care? Well, for starters, it can be used as a basis for invitations. And we see different tournaments that are based on invitations all over the place. I'll give you uh, one example is the Bigfoot Challenge, uh, Bigfoot Challenge 10 ball. Played at Derby City. At the Derby City Classic every year. That's a 16-player invitational event. Jay Helford is typically the tournament director for that. He will be again in 2016. And when he heard about Fargo ratings, he, he was quick to ask, can we use that as a basis for invitations? Because one of the biggest headaches that Jay goes through every year is who to invite. Who am I going to make mad? Whose feelings am I going to hurt? Who's, who's playing the best right now? These are questions that are very tough to answer unless you have Fargo ratings out there defining who the best 16 players are right now. So they made a decision, Jay Helford and, and Diamond Billiard Products, that they, were gonna, they are going to use Fargo ratings as the basis to invite the top 16 players in the world to the Bigfoot Challenge. If any of those 16 decline the invitation, they'll just go right down the list until they fill up all 16 spots. With the caveat that prior year's players get an invite to oh, courtesy I should, there. I should clarify. Because they, 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 this wasn't the basis the previous years. I should clarify, uh, and I should have wrote this down. I think it's 12, and they're going to keep four di discretionary spots for notable players right. that, that may not be up there, but right. they know the fans want to yeah. see. Also, the WPA uh, World Championship invitations. Uh, each country gets a certain number of invitations to World Championship events. You know, right now in the USA, there's, or at least there was, a system where um, the BCA, for example, might uh, uh, come up with a list of some prominent USA mm -hmm. events, and based on how players do in those events, they earn points. And then right. the top two or three points leaders at the end of the year get invited to the World Championships. That's about as good of a system as you could have until Fargo ratings come along. Um, so it could be used as a means for that. Uh, Moscone Cup's another example. It's, it's always a big mystery as to who's going to be on the team every year, which players will be, will the Europeans pick, which players will be on the USA team. How will they be picked? This year they had a pretty good system. They had a list of 10 or 11 events, I think. Uh, similar thing, based on how you do in those events, you earn points. Top three were automatically on the team. Two were discretionary picks. Fargo ratings could be used uh, as that method as well. Speaking of Moscone Cup. You can do that one, but you might want to back up. Go ahead. Um, back I, me I, up. I, I, yeah. 
Fargo is not dependent upon nine foot tables. It's depending upon two people playing, and they can play eight ball, nine ball, ten ball. They can play on seven foot, eight foot, nine foot, ten foot tables, because it's the data between the two players. It's the relationship between the two players. So it, 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 it in fact, Steve could probably expand on that, but I know that they, they input the data on seven foot or nine foot, and I think you found it just doesn't make any difference. We, it's, we, it's, so it's, we do. So, so I did say earlier that, you know, it's the win or loss that counts, and that, that is. That's the only number that goes into Fargo ratings. But we do like to record the match type, you know, the, the game format. Was it eight ball? Was it 10 ball? What size equipment was it on? And for purely that reason, as early on we did some statistical analysis, because you hear that there are, you know, seven foot artists and, yeah. and whatever yeah. that, are, that are much better. So we did analysis over a broad spectrum of players, pros, amateurs, both sides. And what we found out is, yeah, maybe, maybe one guy is a little bit better on a seven foot table than not, but on average, it, there is no different. The good players, it doesn't matter yeah. what equipment they're playing on sure. or what the game type is. And it gets, after a while, it gets ridiculous because pretty soon you say, well, what kind of cloth? How, cut, how, how small were the pockets? You know, you can get ridiculous. And this is, the beauty of this system is it's so simple for the data to get compiled and it's, and it's, it's still, you don't, you're not losing any of the accuracy. So now you can talk about Mr. Moscone. Oh, I can And his cup. Oh, thanks. <laughs> Appreciate that. So speaking of the Moscone cup, uh, which I'm really excited for. It's going to be right here right in Las street. Vegas, December 7th through 10th. If you can make it out here, if there are tickets left, I encourage oh, you to yeah. do so. It's a one-of-a-kind event. If you can't make it, uh, watch the pay-per-view. It is a terrific show. Matchroom does an awesome job. Yep. The best. But as it relates to Fargo ratings, um, something interesting. You know, Europe is on, Mark, up. Uh, you probably have this in your head. How many years in a row has Europe beaten the U.S.? Oh, I, actually, I don't know that. A lot. But it's been like six out of the last seven years or something like it's, that. It's been know. a lot. Um, yeah. Last but the, pre, the early years, it was just the opposite. The U.S. won like eight in a row or something like that. But it's, Last it's year was a little better. I think USA scored, what, five, five or six points. The year before the year was before that was uh, completely rock bottom. It was like 11 to the, 1. 2, something like that, yeah. It was a trouncing. This year is interesting. Earlier today, I looked up the Fargo ratings of every player on the USA team and the European team. And what I found was a little bit fascinating, if we could show this graphic. So, if you add up the Fargo ratings of all of the players, the combined rating for the USA team is 39.50. The European team is 39.23. Fargo ratings would seem to imply that USA will win this year. But it's really slight. And here's something else that's interesting. Yeah, it's really interesting. Yeah. There's a greater spread between the top and bottom on the USA team than there is on the European team. And that sort of feels right. You, you hear a lot of talk that, uh, one, you hear talk that Europe is deep. But you also hear that they're so consistent. Look at the tightness. Look at the bottom three guys on the European team. 7-7-8, seven, 7-7-7, seven, 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 and 7-7-6. Seven, seven, That's yep. amazingly tight. And even Darren's only 7-91. It's only like only, 13 points above. Only 7 but yeah, yeah. <laughs> I understand that. But, but as far as the, uh, you know, uh, the, the values, because... Um, but but here, here here's the interesting thing too. Look at look at the the two bottom guys on the USA team, Skylar Woodward and Corey Duell. Those two players are rated lower than all five of the European players. So what does that mean? Well, we don't know. But if you but if you go by the theory of adding up the points and seeing which team it has a greater likelihood of winning. It would seem to imply, and I want the math guy or the computer guy to step in and correct me, <laughs> I'm going to go out on a limb and predict an 11 to 10 win for the USA. Team. I'll stand right beside you. <laughs> See, and, and I'm, I'm almost going to take the opposite side because, because of the single factor. The consistency factor. Well, the, the singles, because you've got five guys playing our five guys, and other than Shane, they could be, our guys could be almost the lower points across the board. Yeah. And, you know, and, and so the singles, we could lose 
based on that. The team is a mix match and the doubles. So uh, I want the U.S. to win, but I'd actually, I'm going to actually predict 11-9 Europe. Well, here, here's the beauty. If USA, in fact, wins 11 to 10, I'm going to replay this, and I'm going to tout Fargo ratings as yeah. the best predictor okay. ever created. If it doesn't happen, then nobody I'm will just, ever see it. I'm just going to say upsets happen. Yeah. <laughs> as everybody on AZ Billiards scream, it's variance. Some people should re look up the word variance in the dictionary. No, but, in, in all seriousness, in all seriousness, all, there's uh, no way to tell who's going to win. Uh, not short races. Europe is incredibly talented. I think our team, the USA team, is incredibly talented this year. I think they picked a very good team. Yeah. Um, but I am. this actually got me excited because, you know, it's easy after five or six years of straight losses to get the impression that USA just can't beat Europe. They're not there yet. Well, they, I don't believe that. They need more time. No. Um, I don't believe that. I don't either. I think, I, I think this is going to be. This is a coin toss. This is going to be one hell of a Moscone yeah. Cup, and you don't want to miss it. Yeah. And I'm going to predict 11 to 10. Just yeah, because. Just because. We're talking of predictions, and I don't know how it turned out with the U.S. Open, but with the world's nine ball, out of the 128 players, Fargo ratings, out of the top four players in the world's nine ball came out of the top eight ranked players out of all 128 people. That's correct. That's pretty yeah. damn strong. You know, when you take 128 people and say, well, these are the top eight, and four of them come in the top four? Because that gets to the luck of the draw at well, this look, point because they knock each other out. In all, yeah. in all fairness, Mark, let's, oh, we're not awesome. saying that Fargo ratings will predict the winners oh, no, of every no, tournament. No, 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 no. <laughs> Upsets happen. If that were the case, there's no need to even play. Upsets happen. These players are rated so close, you never know. I mean, you could have Shane Van Boning and, and Mike DeShane, for example, play each other, and it could be 11 and nothing. I mean, you don't know. These guys play good. Uh, but... Broadly speaking, generically speaking, on average, yeah. uh, it's a heck of an indicator. Yep. And, well, and the it probability is. It's historically there. based. You can't argue with history. You know, it's... With that, yeah. I have nothing. Any closing thoughts, Steve? None for me. Well, thank well, you for if, joining us. If you have any questions about Fargo, AZ Billiards, there is some good information. Just make sure you can separate the bad from it. Just do a little research or contact us, and we'll answer the questions that we can. Uh, we're not saying it's the best thing since sliced bread, but it's pretty damn strong, and it's going to change pool. Yeah. Pool's needed a standard. This is going to become the gold standard. You know. Get on board early, folks. Yeah. Sanction, sanction your league with the BCA Pool League yeah. or start a USA Pool yeah. League. We got lots of cool toys and gadgets oh, it's, coming. It's going to be. It's 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 going to change pool. Good night. All right. All right. Thanks. Thanks. See you John. later.